Well, how about Greek? We have the New Testament uh, written in Greek. Um, what what led to that? I mean, why why not some other language? Why didn't Hebrew continue to be the main language? Well, I think mainly it's due to its general inferiority to <laughs> the Greek language, uh, or at least that's what I would tend to want to say if my Old Testament colleagues weren't around. <laughs> Welcome back to Roundtable, episode 21. I'm Jared Luchibor. We're launching into a new three-part series on biblical studies here at Mid-America Reform Seminary. We thought we'd take some time to discuss what it means to do biblical scholarship and what it means to teach biblical studies in a seminary. And we thought we'd start with just even a discussion on the biblical languages. Mid-America is one of the seminaries which are uh, getting fewer and fewer as time goes by that have a rigorous commitment to and requirement of the biblical languages. Mid-America not only has classes strictly in Hebrew and Koine Greek, but even during their time in exegesis classes, Old Testament and New, students are thoroughly engaged in the biblical languages as they weave their way through the biblical text in their time of learning. Taking part in this discussion in speaking order are Associate Professor of Old Testament, Reverend Mark Vanderhart, Assistant Professor of Old Testament, Reverend Andrew Compton, and Associate Professor of New Testament, Dr. Marcus Minninger. They start with a basic question. In what languages was the Bible written? Well, the Bible was written in uh, ancient Hebrew, and um, Hebrew is simply a dialect of um, Semitic languages that was found in uh, Palestine, in Canaan. And um, the New Testament was written in uh, Greek, but not uh, classical Attic Greek. It was written in Koine Greek. And uh, portions of the Old Testament uh, sections in Ezra and Daniel uh, particularly were written in ancient Aramaic, another Semitic language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, just to uh, elaborate on what Professor Compton said, I remember meeting uh, at Princeton Seminary students who were taking either summer Greek or summer Hebrew. Either one. Either one, and they were graduates already of Princeton Seminary. And when I asked them the question, well, why are you taking one of those languages now? They said, well, Princeton requires uh, knowledge of one of the original languages, either Hebrew or Greek. They don't require a knowledge of both. But the presbyteries back then uh, required a knowledge of both. Hmm. And so having graduated with their seminary degree, they were now coming back to uh, study the language, the other language, so that they might meet a presbytery hmm. um, requirement. And so when I asked them, oh, you, you are only taking Hebrew now, in your exegesis courses, how did you exegete the text? And they looked at me and they said, from English Bible, of course. Hmm. And uh, the conversation then went in a different direction, but I thought, oh my, oh my. Wow. Um, the knowledge of both languages is so important for the reading of the text. Yeah, it really goes into being able to more effectively explain the meaning of a text. Even if you use a particular English translation in your churches, um, there's still a need to be able to illustrate what that English translation is trying to capture. And how do you even do that with a, without knowledge of both of these biblical languages? Now, we typically, and most, most seminaries... Uh, don't spend as much time on Aramaic. Often they don't have a specific class, although we have Mid-America at times offered offered Aramaic, and you've had uh, over the years students come in and um, and do that. Seems like a lot of times students will, once they're grounded in Hebrew, be able to learn a degree of how Aramaic relates. You did mention that they're both Semitic languages. There's a whole family of languages related to Hebrew and Aramaic. Some of them... Um, People may be more aware of than others. There's Akkadian that, that some people have heard of ancient texts being written in, ancient flood stories, ancient accounts, ancient kings lists. Uh, there's, um, well, even Arabic is a Semitic language. Most people know of Arabic, but uh, don't realize how old that language truly is. 
there's a whole range of them, which uh, which allows uh, Hebrew and Aramaic to kind of be situated. But it means that if you've got a, a good grounding in Hebrew, uh, you can from there begin to learn to work in Aramaic. Most people don't learn it the other way around. One of my professors said, once you learn one Semitic language, uh, the other 69 come fairly yeah. easily. <laughs> The scripts may differ, but the basic structure of Semitic languages is the same. Uh, well, how about Greek? We have the New Testament uh, written in Greek. Um, what, what led to that? I mean, why, why not some other language? Why didn't Hebrew continue to be the main language? Well, I think mainly it's due to its general inferiority to <laughs> the Greek language, uh, or at least that's what I would... Tend to want to say if my <laughs> Old Testament colleagues weren't around. Yeah. Uh, no, um, I, you know, in, in terms of just basic ancient history, uh, the conquering of the western part of the Mediterranean and much else by Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC, uh, of course, led to a process of the distribution of uh, the spreading of Greek culture, but also Greek language throughout the whole Mediterranean basin, really, and. Um, that continued to be the case, even it was the it was the most dominant language, the most common language, uh, the lingua franca, as they sometimes mm. say, uh, even after the ascendancy of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the language that um, the New Testament authors write in, even when Paul writes to Rome, or even when he writes to a Roman colony like Philippi, uh, where Latin Greek. may have been uh, you know more common in in, in many respects, uh, the the, the, more, the more native language, especially in Rome. Uh, he still writes in Greek. So, um, yeah, it's part of the legacy of of Alexander the Great. Now, the New Testament is generally in a more of a Koine Greek uh, as opposed to an Attic, as, as Professor Vanderhart was just saying. But was there a prestige element even to writing in Greek? Would that have, would that have informed uh, uh, writing in that rather than Latin, even if there were those knowing and reading Latin in certain areas? Yeah, well... So the distinction between Attic and Koine, um, you know, if you go back and you read um, Plato, Aristotle, uh, you'll see a a somewhat more complex language. Hmm. Uh, It's uh, something that graduate students do um, that, um, you know, maybe we we don't typically have that done here, but graduate students uh, in, say, a PhD program, uh, I had to read um, Plato's Apology of Socrates in Greek in my doctoral work, etc. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly a, a significant step up. Uh, there, was a, there was a day and age in which uh, classicists, those who study the classical period of, of uh, ancient Greece, um, were sort of, who, those who were also Christians, were a little concerned about why the New Testament's Greek looks so different and <laughs> uh, kind of uh, tried to make the uh, explanation that uh, it was a it was a special kind of Greek. It was called the Holy Spirit Greek, that was kind of <laughs> divinely given. But it was really sort of an effort to deal with the fact of why is this so much simpler. But Koine means common. It is the common Greek of the first century A.D. and the surrounding uh, period of time. So it's the same basic Greek that you would see uh, being written by Josephus, by Philo, um, mm-hmm. first century mm-hmm. Jews, uh, or uh, that you would see in letters that are uh, being written in the time period, say a soldier writing home to his mother, etc. Uh, you know, we have various uh, ancient letters. We can see the, the similarity. Uh, so it's uh, really the, the Greek of the time period and, and um, can be studied profitably uh, alongside uh, other contemporaneous literature. And also the fact that the uh, apostles... Uh, John, or especially Paul, are writing to a variety of churches throughout the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Uh, even the Jewish communities in uh, Asia Minor and Greece, etc., were probably more literate in the Greek language than they would have been in Hebrew or uh, Aramaic. And therefore, uh, since you have Gentile believers as well as Greek-speaking, Greek-reading uh, Jewish people, it only makes sense that uh, to reach the best, uh, uh, the greatest audience, you would write in Greek. It's interesting. People uh, tend to think even of Hebrew as a very monolithic language, you know, and yet it's it's fascinating that even linguists who study the Hebrew that we find in the Bible have begun to note that there's quite a range of of Hebrew. 
There's some of the earliest material, uh, generally some of the poetic portions like the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 or, or uh, the Song of Deborah, you know, are thought to contain a very early uh, form, a real pared down kind of Greek, uh, Hebrew, I'm sorry. And then uh, more of the prose uh, reflects a more classic period. Uh, they'll sometimes mm-hmm. differentiate archaic biblical Hebrew from classical biblical mm-hmm. Hebrew. And then even books like Chronicles and, and Ezra and Nehemiah begin to shift into a type of Hebrew that reads a lot more like the Mishnah will read or the, or the Talmuds will read, a late biblical Hebrew. And so there's even distinction within the Old Testament based on its relative age of writing. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, kind of even thinking about geography, uh, scholars have begun to notice that there's particular kinds of of dialectical differences between texts and books that are are sort of aimed at the northern kingdom. Think of a book like Hosea, Mm -hmm. you know, where he's bringing a message to Samaria, um, which is different from books that seemed more focused on Jerusalem. And uh, a number of scholars have sought to understand even a linguistic variation. And it's been remarkable how many Hebrew texts have been found by your archaeologists, usually written on pieces of pottery or, or, uh, or written on walls or things like that as decoration. And yet these things have enabled them to, to start positing um, what they sometimes call isoglosses or uh, kind of dialects. It's, it's kind of like the fact that when I came from California, we would call every carbonated beverage a Coke. And now here in, in Chicagoland, every carbonated beverage is called a pop. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a linguistic isogloss. Uh, it's the same kind of thing going on, and we can find uh, similar things in Hebrew. So it just goes to show that there's, um, well, there's a lot to know about these languages. Um, and yet, for the pastor who's tasked not chiefly with trying to understand linguistic isoglosses of northern Hebrew versus southern Hebrew or classical uh, Attic Greek versus a, a Koine Greek or what have you, you know, h- how are the languages um, beneficial? Uh, what are some concrete ways that we even teach men here to use the languages in their pastoral work that they're preparing for? Well, I would say, just to begin to answer your question, it's a great question, that uh, since Biblical Greek, Biblical Hebrew is not the mother tongue of any of our students, that... It's a shame, but yeah. It, well, it's yeah. a shame, but uh, we, we got to face reality. <laughs> yeah, I know. That uh, in learning these languages, your goal would, uh, or you would hope that they would become um, very, very proficient in it, but realistically... Uh, they acquire a reading knowledge, I should hope, in which they're able minimally to follow the discussion of a sound and and good uh, exegetical commentary. Mm -hmm. They can follow Mm -hmm. the argument. They know what's being said, and they can agree or not agree or or, or benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I sometimes liken reading a biblical language to walking on a rock with bare feet, you feel every stone. Hmm. Uh, and hmm. therefore, in reading biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, you're forced to give attention to the words. Now, yeah. you don't isolate those words. You read in context. You read sentences and paragraphs together. But it forces you to listen to this word and to reflect upon its meaning, always in context. Whereas in English, the mother tongue of most of our students, the temptation uh, if it's a temptation, or the the practice of it is, you read quickly over the English yeah. words, and uh, again, that's a translation. You're not hearing the original, and, and therefore, sometimes the nuances of the original can be lost. Yeah, I had a professor talk about the languages force force us to slow down yep. in our reading. Yeah, and I think they also force us to remember that God is pleased to give uh, scriptures that uh, emerge out of and are produced in uh, different contexts, even different contexts that are than our own. Uh, we talk yeah. a lot in the biblical department about the uh, organic nature 
of uh, inspiration, organic inspiration, that God uh, didn't drop the Bible down from heaven unmediated through human authors and didn't just dictate uh, the Bible to human authors, but he worked through their thoughts and feelings and experiences mm-hmm. and native vocabulary, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And so the biblical languages are kind of a start to that in some ways where you start to say, um, I need to seek to learn somebody else's language in order to listen to them most uh, attentively and accurately. Um, really, every translation that you pick up, and we are privileged to have many wonderful translations uh, in the English language uh, that you can uh, really benefit from. Uh, people in the in the pew uh, benefit from those uh, very, very well. Um, and yet, every one of those translations in, into any other language is also an interpretation Uh, and to get more uh, up close and personal with what was really said uh, word for word uh, blow by blow you need to look at it in the original so i think that's a a significant part of it Uh, we want students to be able to translate uh, each passage that they work with in an exegetical paper Uh, and as uh, professor vanderhart said to also really understand and, and make discerning use of the commentaries and other resources that they use as they study texts. Uh, don't just, you know, believe what every commentary says. First of mm-hmm. all, they, they contradict each other. They disagree. Uh, so you have to learn uh, to have discernment there. And, and, of course, a big part of that is uh, knowing the, the, the nuts and bolts and, and the rules of, of grammar and syntax in the language. That's even interesting, too sometimes come across discussions and commentaries and uh, somebody will make some claim uh, about a particular grammatical point and they end up uh, citing some something of like an intermediate or student grammar and it's very interesting if you if you're not sort of aware of even grammatical discussions how grammar is studied in the languages uh, then you could read that while well, some some bible scholar in a published commentary says x this this must be the case but uh, again, knowing it enables us to to ask even a further question. Well, why are they citing that, and mm-hmm. uh, why not a more uh, academic uh, Hebrew grammar or Greek grammar? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Certainly, sometimes people come and they have this sense of, well, why can't we just use all the powerful uh, software tools that are out there now? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, used to be BibleWorks. Now that's that's become uh, defunct, I guess. Uh, I still use it for now, but mm-hmm. um, other others, Accordance, et cetera, Bible software programs, Logos. Um, and uh, there's a, a few reasons why you can't simply um, use those. They're, they're great tools for certain things. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons is that uh, it can often, uh, it can tell you with a high degree of accuracy uh, how to parse a word. You know, is this a, a mm-hmm. present tense verb or a future tense or aorist tense? Uh, but even there, sometimes there's a potential for disagreement and discussion, but you know, generally they're, they're quite good at that, but they won't tell you why, why is that significant? Uh, and then beyond that, um, it certainly won't tell you that every present tense or future or aorist tense verb could do a lot of different things in yeah. Greek. Uh, and well, which one is it? Uh, there's a whole range of different things that each tense can do. And then you talk about each case in terms of nouns, um, and other parts of speech, participles, etc., mm-hmm. uh, it becomes uh, somewhat complex. And of course, that's the beauty of the language. In part, it's nuances. But you can't go to a Bible software program and say, "Which use of the participle is this?" Tell mm-hmm. me uh, indisputably. Uh, mm-hmm. They can give you their opinion, mm-hmm. uh, but really, at that point, is an interpretive opinion and uh, not a, a mere objective piece of data, so to speak. Um, and so, you have to learn. Uh, to delve into the intermediate grammar. We spend quite a bit of time at, at Mid-America on that. And uh, then we also continue to uh, test students in the original languages uh, during their exegetical classes. Every yeah. time you take an exegesis class in Old Testament, you'll also have a Hebrew, te- uh, a Hebrew test that yeah. uh, t- uh, you're supposed to translate and be, be uh, prepared to translate and answer questions about uh, some passage, uh, selection of text from what that course is covering, and then the, the same thing uh, in 
for Greek on the New Testament side so that we can continue to sharpen those tools. And then we seek to integrate that into lecture and discussion, of course, exegetical papers, even for it to inform sermons. We don't yeah. encourage students to be citing Hebrew and Greek directly in sermons on uh, <laughs> usually ever, but certainly not on any regular basis, uh, but that they should know it themselves and, it, and the decisions about it uh, yeah. should be um, percolating into uh, why they preach the way they preach and with the emphases that they preach. And I might just mention uh, while we're on that topic, uh, I think one of the real uh, neat things about uh, our curriculum is that we always pair together uh, an exegesis course with a preaching course. So yeah. when you yeah. take um, interpretation of the Gospels and Acts uh, with with me, uh, then you'll also take uh, preaching from the Gospels and Acts if you're in the MDiv program. Uh, and uh, there you have translation components uh, as well as ex- mm-hmm. broader exegetical components and uh, in, in, in study of the interpretation of these books um, that's uh, then paired together with and the discussion in that about all of that is meant to flow into and you um, write a exegesis paper on a passage mm-hmm. and then you preach on that same passage exegesis should be the the foundation of sermons uh, but uh, then we think about um, how uh, sermons and the goal of writing a sermon also informs our exegesis um, mm-hmm. that there's a, a real cordial pairing of the two it's it's been neat to see that integration here there's not a sense that students are able to finish their their language classes and then put language on the back burner. We just don't really give them that option here because, again, through their whole course of study, as long as they're taking exegesis classes, they're, they're having accountability for, for their grammar, for, their, uh, for vocabulary, for translation. And it's just it's a, it's, it's really well put together. And there's also something, I think, in our, uh, in our classes about coming together to learn the language. You know, a lot of people will will do some prep work on their own, but I think of how many things that I've learned from reading Hebrew in a classroom setting, uh, just in my own studies when I was when I was being taught, and many things I know about the language that I can't actually point to a grammar or to some article that explains it, but I can say, well, I I don't know, but I but this is how you read this. And again, it's not to uh, to create sort of just an, an oral tradition that goes on, but there really is a value to sitting down in a classroom setting as a group and learning, learning in community. Well, I think that people don't always understand how much using language tools requires discernment. Yeah. Uh, inter- yeah. Interpret a translation, like I said before, is an act of interpretation and interpretation isn't done by road. It's done through wisdom and discernment and experience. And so you learn how to do that wisely alongside mm-hmm. of others who have been doing it. And it's just sort of a, a an aspect of the trade, so to speak, uh, something that you get mentored in. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, get get all the tools you can before you come, you know, uh, to seminary. But uh, then there's still a lot to learn yet about how to use those tools. Being a pastor involves a lot of things. It involves, uh, shall we say, skill in uh, dealing with people. Um, You also have to know the pattern of sound words, the Mm. teaching, that uh, the systematic uh, teaching of the Bible. But one of the chief tools of a pastor's trade is words. Mm. Hmm. knowing words in their meaning, their denotation, their connotation, um, enjoying words, creating word pictures, appropriate, and uh, learning the languages, even uh, biblical Hebrew, biblical Greek, forces you to keep um, uh, and enhance your understanding of words and uh, utilizing words. Um, It's not just meeting people for coffee, important as that can be, <laughs> yeah. but it's also working in the Word so that your sermons, faithfully preached, um, you're crafting messages that use words that you've thought about and you've, uh, you've studied. 
speaking of studying, what these fine professors will be discussing next time here on Roundtable is biblical studies and the focus of instruction here, specifically at Mid-America Reformed Seminary. They'll take up how they handle hermeneutics, biblical theology, and more. All of this next time on Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Thanks for joining us.